Please join me in welcoming back to the stage the director of Lee, Ellen Kuras, the producer, Kate Solomon, and Lee Miller's son, Anthony Penrose. Welcome, welcome back, and it's a remarkable story. Kate, I wanna begin by asking you, because I know this story took some time to tell, years. What was it that kept you going as you were facing obstacles, financing, whatever it was that was getting in the way of getting the film made? What was it about Lee Miller's story that kept you going? I think the fact that her tenacity and what she did and put herself through in order to tell the truth is so much more than we had to go through for these, you know, to get this made. And, you know, as Anthony would testify, what, when someone has seen all of that, you can't let it go and it will be with you forever. And I think we have to just keep going till we manage to tell that story and make sure that enough people see it. And Ellen, when you uh, came on board, what was it that first drew you to it? And then what kind of responsibility did you feel? Because this does become the on-the-record story of Lee Miller. This is something that will go around the world, I'm sure, and people will know this as the story of Lee Miller, what, what you've created in the film. Um, how, how did you approach that kind of responsibility? Well, I came up to the film in 2018 after Kate had bought a table um, that would belong to Lee Miller. And she had called me up and she said, oh my God, you know, I have this table by Lee Miller. We had talked about Lee Miller before. Um, and she said, why has there never been a film about Lee Miller before? So started making, you know, putting together the script. And then I came in um, in 2018 when she asked me if I would direct the film. And I was really thrilled because, you know, I knew that, you know, to make a film about Lee Miller was a really special thing, me, myself, being a photographer and cinematographer, and having been in war and, you know, having seen what she had gone through. But what was really interesting was the, the emotional story of what happened to Lee, and to try and find the thread of that perspective, and also to tell it in a different light way and through a different lens. You know, not to, to be looking at Lee all the time, but to be with her and to feel her heartbeat, which is what we literally introduce the audience to when, we, when we're running with her and we feel her heartbeat and we hear her breathing. So, you know, I was really interested in being able to bring audience to a more visceral experience of, of who, Lee will, who Lee was and what she did. She was at so many pivotal points in 20th century history and the moments during World War II, especially her Holocaust photography, they're still shocking today. And you know the whole um, idea of photographing and documenting the Holocaust is a very charged one. And as you were approaching how to represent that in the film, I imagine you had a lot of conversations about how you would do that. The photos exist, those are Lee's photos, but then you're also bringing your own lens to it. Can you talk a little bit about um, how you went about deciding what you would show, what you wouldn't show, and, and what kind of choices you had to make, both of you, Kate and, and Ellen? Well, we discussed it a lot, didn't we, with Kate as well. And ne when Lee took those pictures, they were almost unbelievable, and people didn't know that was happening. But when we are making this film, 80 years later, people have those images in their head, and they know what happened. And so you want to play it from on Andy Samberg and Kate Winslet's reaction because you can see what's happening to them when they see this and therefore you can experience that. And then when we went into the edit, we very clearly wanted to show Lee's picture and we left it there so that people had to keep looking and to an almost uncomfortable time because you need to... You've seen the images, but have you really looked and examined them for that long? And that was a really emotional moment, I think, to show Lee's images of that, show what she saw and why it affected her so much and everyone. You know, Kate and I had talked about not showing a literal depiction of Dachau um, because we've seen camp 
we've seen movies about the concentration camps and you know when, we, when I went to uh, location scouting you know there was a set that had been used for concentration camps and I said no you know we really want to look for something that's more interior to be able to be able to feel the the feeling of it and it's more suggestive to show what you're not showing and for audiences to imagine what that is but again it's you know as Kate is saying you know it's you know, being able to see how that plays emotionally on on Lee and on Davy, you know, Kate and, and Andy Samberg was was far more important and much more emotive. And you know, the the photograph was important to show. We didn't want to be able to show you know the the stacks of bodies in the camp necessarily. We wanted to be able to see it through Lee's point of view, and that was was really important. You know, I said, we need to show it from how Lee saw it. And that was her intention. And because it wasn't published, you know, that was even more of our intention to make sure that that happened. And I'm sure, Tony, you can elaborate on, you know, all of the photos that she took. You know, it was part of her drive to get those photos out there and to be published was that Lee was such a staunch supporter of justice, as you were talking about earlier, and that... That's part of the thing that happens, and I can identify with that, is that when you're going out and you're, something's happening to people, and having been in the war in El Salvador, you know, photographing it, you want people to see and witness, you know, what you've seen and for them to know. And I think that that is really important for Lee. Anything you'd like to add about that piece of it, Anthony? I think Helen said it very carefully and correctly there because the point was that Lee took these photographs to inform us and we need informing now, today, right now, this minute, as much as we did in 1945. The validity, the importance of those images has not dimmed at all and for me it's wonderful to see them so appropriately displayed in this movie because there's nothing sensational about the way it's done. It's factual, and that's where it belongs. Um, Kate Winslet uh, couldn't be with us tonight, but Ellen, you shot Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. Was that when you first worked with Kate? Yeah, very much so. That was in 2002 that we shot the film. The film came out in 2003, and she and I, you know, became very, very close friends after that, and I've been looking for a project to do together. And so when you know, the conversation came up about Lee Miller, because we had shared a book, I had bought a book and had given it to her years before when we were doing Eternal. And so there was that conversation that was started early on, and this is, you know, became a continuation of that. But of course, you know, Kate spent so many hours with Tony down at Farley Farm and just, you know, really dove into becoming that character in a way that, you know, as we see her performance is so viscerally powerful and brilliant. And even we were sitting up there and I, I didn't want to leave the theater because I was so drawn back into the story again and her performance and what she was able to accomplish. And, you know, it's just, just being able to see that and feel that, she leaves us with the emotional part of the story. She's exceptional in the film. I am curious though, uh, she's playing your mother. Did you ever correct her and say, no, that's not what my mom was like? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, you know, I didn't need to. Um, she, she started off by having this kind of immersive quality of research. She would come to Farley's, she would sit in the archive, she would read and read and read and then look at pictures and look at more pictures and actually say very little or nothing. And then she would come out with some really poignant question, really incisive remark. And we would discuss that point that she'd raised and then she'd get on with some more reading or some more looking at pictures. And this went on for weeks. And then when I saw her on set, being Lee, I realized why that preparation had taken place because it just allowed her to recreate Lee as a person. The other things that were going for her in her favor was that they're both, in many ways, their personalities are very similar. 
They both have this incredible generosity. They both have this incredible curiosity. They want to know how and why and what about everything. They both are daring, you know, physically, emotionally, and in every way. And there's another quality too. They're both very beautiful, but the key factor is they're both highly intelligent and they know how to use that intelligence to create what they want. And in this case, it was Kate creating Lee. And there were times when, one time in particular, when I saw the film for the first time, we got towards the end and there's a scene where she's getting quite cranky um, as, as an old woman. And there was this extraordinary moment when I forgot that I was watching a film. I thought it was my mum had come back to life and having this dialogue. And it was really this kind of cognitive dissonance at that moment. I couldn't work out which was real, which was the movie, and so on. It took me literally a couple of seconds to get a grip and come back into the reality. And that, for me, is an indication as to how convincingly Kate played my mum. I do want to give uh, some time for your question, so if you've got something, please prepare that. But there's one last thing I want to ask you, Kate. You and Kate Winslet um, have charted a remarkable path through the film industry, and you have chosen projects that really demonstrate um, the power of telling untold, or previously untold stories about women in particular. And also, uh, Tony, you mentioned daring. Some of these roles are incredibly daring. We had Ammonite here at the festival in 2020, which is a, just a rem another remarkable performance from Kate, but going all the way back to just about everything she's done. How do you choose the projects that you will decide to make together, and, and what is driving that, uh, those decisions? Well, I think what drives them is when you find something that is a story that is about one particular person, often, or one particular event, and there's something about that person or event that speaks to, universally, to everyone. And it's finding something that does that, and that's when you know you can use that film to bring everyone together to a cause or to a, 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 a thought process where your mind will go into a place you haven't been. And when you find that, then the kind of possibilities are endless and it's really exciting and you can use it like a little piece of DNA that tells a whole story and finding those moments and it was this with Lee was that it's not a biopic it's picking that period that is the essence of Lee and that's those 10 years from the sunny south of France to the darkness of Dachau and that formed her character and tells you about her and about what was happening it's finding those moments and then making them work to the big world. Okay. Any questions from you out here? Let's go right here first, yes? Oh, yep. And no microphone? Uh, I'll repeat the question. Oh, okay. So I just wanted to say I was so captivated by the film because I've been following it for six to 10 years since its inception. So congratulations for finally making it show to all of us in the world. Thank you. And I was going to ask you a question about the parallels between Lee's struggles as a woman and also the filmmakers and directors' struggles as, as a cast of women getting this film made. But since Cameron already asked you beautifully. So my question is, I also saw another parallel. There's a line near the end that goes, you cannot publish these images because they're too disturbing, i.e. the truth is too disturbing. Can you comment on the parallels with even nowadays where people want to either change history or banish history or banish books because they told the truth as when it was? Mm -hmm. Can you comment on that? And okay. Sorry, Cameron, I hope you can yep, I can summarize that for you. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so she's been following the project for, for many years and uh, wanted to focus on a line towards the end, uh, which is about you cannot banish history, and wanted to ask you about how that uh, resonates with what's going on in the world today, for whoever wants say, to take that. And I would say, Tony, maybe you can speak to that about the, the truth and how important it was for, for Lee to, to search for the truth. Lee had a saying which has been our touchstone 
right through the whole formation of the archive and for the making of this film. And she used to say, you can say anything you like as long as it's the truth. And I think that's a good thing to live by because we share the feeling about when we see people banning books, when we see people trying to control the media and filter out things that are unacceptable to them, but we need to know, that makes us very angry. And I think the function of artists is to be angry and to make other people angry about injustices. And so I think that's probably been a, a kind of drive in us making this film, hasn't it? Yes, to expose the injustices so that everyone sees them. Thank you, and thanks for the question. All right, we'll go, is there, oh yeah, there's one over here, go ahead. Uh, this has to be the last question, go ahead. publishing the photos and making the information known. So I'm struck by the juxtaposition of sort of, on the one hand, maybe not telling you everything that was in the attic, but at the same time, wanting to get everything published. Can you maybe um, The question is about the, um, maybe a dichotomy between uh, Lee Miller being very open and wanting to publish uh, the photos, but then also not revealing to you and family members uh, what you found in the attic. That's a very good question because it does expose the paradox here. Yes, she wanted those images to be seen, but I think that at the end of the war, when so much was unpublished, I think there was a kind of crisis point in her, and that is possibly why she stopped being a photojournalist. By 1954, she had done her last article for Vogue, and that was a fairly uh, you know, lightweight, jokey, a very good piece but it doesn't have the import that the war material has. And I think that's the moment when she decided that she was just going to stop being a photojournalist. And in that moment, she had already stashed away her entire output of work, right from her Paris studio onwards, in a series of boxes, and she'd hidden it in the roof of our old farmhouse. And she then, started off, she's continued to take pictures, but not in a kind of a, in, in, in a commercial way. Um, but she then reinvented herself as this gourmet surrealist cook and had a completely other career and eventually became written up in, in all the smart magazines and that kind of thing. And uh, she had just put the photojournalism aside because I felt that in a way that she just had not the strength to go on with it. And she was smart enough to know that that was the time to quit. But actually what she didn't realize is that that legacy was to be discovered and made into what we now call the Lee Miller Archive. And that's been the source material for Kate and Kate and Ellen to make this movie. So yeah, she put it down, but the material itself would not allow itself to be put down. Thanks for your question. Thanks so much for your answer. That is all the time we have. Thank you for bringing Lee to Toronto. Please join me in thanking again Anthony Penrose, Kate Solomon, and director Alan Curris. Thanks for coming tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.